Welcome to this week at the NCPA. The pitch is feverish. The NCPA International Jazz Festival comes to town 24th, 25th, 26th of November. The box office is now open and bustling. Tickets are going out fast. Book my show is where you need to go. And for all information, even for tickets, ncpamumbai.com. On the second evening, popular American pianist Emmett Cohen will be joined by trumpeter, vocalist Benny Benak III. And Benny joins me today. Hi, Benny. How are you? I'm doing well. Looking forward to coming out. You know, my birthday is November 23rd, so I'm going to be celebrating at the concert. That is so cool. And I'm given to understand this is only going to be your second trip to India ever. And uh, we, we're, we're happy to host you. Talk about your last experience here. Well, I was on tour with a show called Postmodern Jukebox. That is a big production show in the States. They have a big uh, online following where you do jazz covers of, of pop and rock songs. And we were in the middle of a tour in Europe and they said, we've got a concert for you guys in New Delhi. So we jumped off our European tour. We were in India for one day. I, I think I got to have some food. I, I might have ridden around in, in a tuk-tuk and then pretty much we did a party and we were gone back to Europe a day later. So. It was a blur. I'm looking forward this trip. We have a few days to to really uh, immerse ourselves in the culture. Well, Indian fans have been uh, reading up on you. There's also a magazine called uh, On Stage with the National Center of Performing Arts, NCPA puts out. There's a bit of about you on that. I believe that uh, you carry some great lineage, uh, Benny. Your granddad was a trumpeter, band leader. Your dad, a saxophonist, clarinetist. Uh, clarinet, clarinetist. <laughs> Sorry for the uh, the slip of the tongue. It. And and you guys have been in this for generations. I'd like you to talk about your family a little bit, please. Well, it it really is a family affair. Uh, not only am I the third Benny Benack that plays music, but also my mother Claudia is a vocal professor at Carnegie Mellon University, wow. uh, a factory for Broadway stars. So I always say I get the singing from my mother's side, and I get the the horn playing from my father's side. And you know, even from the time I was five or six years old, I was singing and performing, and I always knew that playing jazz music was what I was going to do. And when I was young, if I would have said, hey, one day you're going to be playing at a jazz festival in India, you're going to get to see the world, it would have been like my my dreams came true. So uh, I'm, I'm really fortunate to be a part of the festival this year. You know, it's really exciting for us. The show uh, with Emmett Cohen on the 25th is called Jazz's Greatest Showman. And you're going to be showing some of your, your vocal chops as well as your your very flareful playing. Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, Louis B. Armstrong, Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie. All of that is on the menu, isn't it? Talk to me about, about those greats. Yeah, I mean, so much great music to dig into there. And not only, I think when Emmett and I were coming up with the title of Greatest Showman, not only great musicians, but also great entertainers. And these were artists that knew how to connect with an audience and knew how to make a concert an experience. And then of course, when it came down to the nuts and bolts of the music, they were remarkable as well. And I think that's something when Emmett and I play together now, we've known each other half our lives. So when we play together, the music is always on a high level and the connection with the audience is also on a high level. So anyone that's coming to the show, you're going to be dancing, you're going to be singing, you're going to be a part of uh, a part of the experience. Benny, do you enjoy doing uh, primetime television? Because I'll tell you this, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert uh, is very, very popular in India and you do make, uh, uh, you know, the odd appearance on it. Do you enjoy yourself doing stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I tell my parents which episode to record and I say, hey, right before we go to commercial, pause the screen for five seconds. You'll see me up there, you know, and uh, it, it's it's always a thrill. And anytime you get to perform in front of that many people, you know that you're reaching that wide of an audience. It, it's a great opportunity. So I love that on the late show, the house band really promotes a, a lot of jazz music. So millions of people around the world 
even if it's just going to commercial and they're kind of listening in the background, it's jazz music. So to me, that's really exciting. Benny, everybody knows you as a fiery trumpet player. What do you is special about Emmett Cohen? Uh, what's so great about performing uh, with him when you do these gigs together? Well, I think I talk about it a lot the same way sports. So when you have talented teams that sometimes come together, there's a lot of talent, but they haven't been playing together that long. So there's not chemistry in the way they play together. But for Emmett and myself, we met when we were 16 years old in high school. And that, that was half of our lives. So you think of all the hours and all of the concerts that we played together over decades, the connection that you have, it's like we finish each other's sentences musically. So uh, we don't even need to look at each other if we want to switch the key or switch the tempo or change the harmony. These things just happen uh, almost second nature. And you only really find that when you've been playing together with someone for so long. So it really is a special connection uh, that we have. Emmett played on my latest album. And of course, I, I've had the pleasure of being on his uh, online show, Emmett's Place, a bunch of times over the last couple of years. It, it's, it's just uh, always an adventure when we play together. That's so beautifully described. Thilo Wolf, another icon as far as jazz is concerned, is also at the festival. And he said to me, he said to him, the beauty of jazz is, is the big band. You're no stranger to, uh, to the big band because, you know, when Christian McBride, uh, you know, sets up uh, the big band, you're frequently called upon to play in the trumpet section. How much do you enjoy being a part of that? You know, it's amazing. And the, the tour that I did with Christian McBride's big band, uh, for me at that time, it was early in my 20s. And it was the closest thing I could ever get to being in Duke Ellington's band or Count Basie's orchestra or being on tour with Charles Mingus and his band. We were in a double decker bus with sleeping bunks and we would play a concert and then go to sleep on the bus, wake up the next day in another country, play another concert. And uh, like, like, you were just saying the quintessential sound of jazz. We think of when it was really popular music and when it was what people were listening to on the radio and kids were dancing to, it was the sound of big band. So for me, there's nothing more fun than being a part of that sound. That really is kind of like our orchestra for jazz, the big band. Well, Benny Benack Sr., Benny Benack Jr., and now Benny Benack III. Uh, your dad and granddad, your family is originally from Pittsburgh. Do you, do you still live there, Benny? Or do you manage to go often? I live in New York City. Actually, I live about 15 New York City blocks from Emmett's apartment. So when we're both in New York, you know, we get to grab a coffee or we get to just hang out and go to the gym and, and work out. But I was just in Pittsburgh last weekend. My parents are still there. And as a matter of fact, um, I'll be going back home for Christmas and playing a holiday concert with my parents. So when I go back to Pittsburgh, I get to play with my mom and dad. And uh, when I was younger, I took it for granted, you know, and now that I come home rarely and get to perform with them and everyone in the room is in tears and saying how beautiful the moment it is. I say, oh, wow, I guess it really is special that I'm up here on stage with my parents, you know. It must feel special when people say, uh, here's a singer who who has a natural expressive delivery like Frank Sinatra. Here's a, a post-bop trumpet player in the vein of Kenny Dorham and Freddie Hubbard. Um, is it always equal, the trumpet playing and the vocals? Or do you lean towards one department more than the other sometimes? You know, I, I, I think it's a, it's a living, breathing balance. You know, there are some days where uh maybe i wake up on the wrong side of the bed and there's a frog in my throat and i say okay well tonight's concert we're gonna be we're gonna be freddie hubbard we're gonna be trumpet and then there's other days where i wake up and i feel like i got punched in the mouth you know because the night before i had to play a really loud concert or something and i say well tonight we're really going to be more uh frank sinatra tony bennett because you know the dizzy gillespie high notes aren't coming out on the trumpet so you know, it, it's balanced, but I, I look at them really like uh, they have equal seats at the table in my music now. And most concerts when I'm performing, I do almost 50 50 percent of both. I mean, I, they're really kind of uh, in my mind, they're they're equal. 
We are very proud of the National Center of Performing Arts here in Mumbai city in India. Uh, there's the Jamshed Baba Theatre in the facility where, which is home to the Symphony Orchestra of India, uh, where Maestro Zubin Mehta recently came and conducted the orchestra. Uh, there's the Tata Theatre, which is another massive facility. There are smaller theatres like the Experimental Theatre and the Little Theatre and the Godrej. So we're talking a National Center of Performing Arts, which has about, you know, five auditoria, some smaller performing spaces and art galleries. You must have heard of it. You must be looking forward to to coming here and performing and also taking a guided tour. Yeah, we, we've had this circled on the calendar for a long time. I remember when Emmett said to me, hey, I know your birthday is November. What do you think about celebrating your birthday? at the NCPA in India and playing a concert. And I said, this has got to be once in a lifetime opportunity uh, to have a celebration like this and be a part of this. And of course, have heard so much about the performance venues. And I think one of the first things we do when we get there is we're going to have this tour. So I'm going to be uh, soaking it all in. My last question is about uh, other acts on the bill. Uh, have you collaborated with, have you heard Jane Mon Height? She's on the final day. Cuban pianist Alfredo Rodriguez is here with his trio. And of course, day one has Thilo, Phil, uh, Thilo Wolf and uh, Johanna Issa. And of course, day two has uh, Emmett and yourself. So anything you'd like to say about any of the uh, other performers? I mean, it's an incredible lineup. Uh, you know, I, I we're going to be there for day one. So we will be checking out Thilo Hill and his performance. I'm excited. I'm going to be in the audience for that. Alfredo is, is uh, you know, another rising star and, and you kind of see each other at festivals, passing ships. So we're going to get to hang out and appreciate that art. And Jane Monheit, actually, uh, I performed with her when I was at the Manhattan School of Music. Our wow. student big band backed her up in the big band at Birdland Jazz Club in New York. So I got to know her and her husband, Rick, who is her drummer. And they are just wonderful artists. Jane is beautiful voice, beautiful spirit. And so it, it's a pretty magical lineup and, and we're really honored to be a part of it. Guys, uh, Benny Manak III is here for the NCP International Jazz Festival. He performs with American pianist Emmett Cohen. Look forward to his trumpet playing. Look forward to his vocals. 24th, 25th, 26th of November. Tickets are at Book My Show uh, and all details at ncpamumbai.com. I really appreciate your time, Benny, and I look forward to seeing you here in India. All right, we'll be there soon. Thanks for having me. It's really a fascinating uh, exhibition that I have to tell you about. This week at the NCPA, of course, talks about all the action that's happening on stage as well as off it in the National Center of the Performing Arts. Sky Islands, an endangered Indian landscape, will be held at the Dilip Piramal Art Gallery from the 23rd of November to the 3rd of December. Now, entry to the gallery is absolutely free. But all details are at ncpamumbai.com as well as book my show. So you might want to go and uh, check the listings. Now why it's really special also because uh, in the curriculum as part of uh, this wonderful exhibition, there shall also be some workshops and uh, those workshops will be conducted uh, by experts and we're going to meet them and uh, we'd like you to be a part of it. And uh, for those workshops, spots are going out very, very fast. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Corey Stickrude. Uh, Corey is principal at uh, the Korei Kanal Inst uh, International School. And the wonderful part is it is his alma mater. He attended uh, as a student from 1977 through his graduation in 86. He returned to KIS in 2012 as vice principal and then has been principal since 2013. Hi, Corey. How are you? Great, great. Thanks for having us. This is exciting. An absolute pleasure to welcome Ian Lockwood, educator, photographer, writer with an enduring interest in the ecology, landscapes and cultures of South Asia. And really one of the finest, Ian. And like I said, uh, uh, some special people conducting those workshops. That is indeed Ian. He will also be delivering a lecture. He makes a living working as an educator and he's taught photography, environmental science and geography at renowned colleges. How are you, Ian? I'm great tonight. Thanks for having us on. It's, it's good to be on the show. I love photographers and their early influences. Um, for you, I believe, Ian, it was your father. Would you tell us about uh, some early influences in your work courtesy your dad? 
Sure. Yeah. Well, I also uh, our family has an old sort of relationship with uh, KIS, with Cody Connell International School, in, in the hills there, and uh, so um, you know, I, my my grandparents had actually first uh, visited, and, and my both my parents were were students there, uh, but my father was interested in in uh, photography. He he worked in the yearbook, I think, and. Um, so when I was growing up, later on, we always had a dark room in the house. And uh, back in those days, before digital cameras and computers and all of that, you made pictures in, you know, usually in your bathroom that was converted. Uh, so I grew up with the smell of uh, photographic chemicals in the house and um, got interested in that through my father. But more than that, I got interested in, in these, what we now call the Sky Islands, which is what this exhibition is about. So I, I got interested in the hills, um, uh, that are, you know, the Palmi Hills of, of South India are, are really beautiful. And um, they have uh, some stunning landscapes that I, I think are sort of underappreciated, I suppose. So it's a little secret for those of us that have, have lived down there. Um, but my father was interested in, in uh, you know, sort of the landscapes and sort of uh, using, using photography to depict the landscapes. And uh, I, I sort of, I took that from him and, and sort of ran with it. He had lots of other things that he, he does. He's an, an inventor and a food scientist and, and that. But um, I, I sort of took that idea of, of landscape and landscape change in that environment and sort of have made that sort of a big focus of what I've done in, in my sort of professional and uh, personal life. Um, yeah. Corey, uh, the main reason why the Kodai Canal uh, International School is involved is because you really want to spread spread some very important messages uh, to the people at large. And the school's Center for Environment and Humanity is at the core of that. Tell us about uh, KISS CEH. Yeah, so so it actually we actually started it a few years ago before the pandemic. And I think it's it's really exciting to see it hit its stride right now. Um, our vision is to empower people uh, from all walks of life uh, individually or in, in whatever uh, collective form to become agents of change um, and specifically agents of change for a sustainable future. We do this through experiential learning. Um, we, we, we hope it leads to actual and practical solutions uh, for issues that relate to how humans interact with the environment. Um, we want to be a model of how a small community, you know, here in the Polony Hills, which Ian is so brilliantly photographed, um, can drive a, um, a self-sustaining and a, you know, an inclusive future for uh, not just the Polity Hills, but really for everyone and, and even the people in Mumbai. That's lovely. I believe very early on, and you continue to, um, Ian, you've worked with forest departments, conservation organizations in the Western Ghats. Those must have been some solid learnings uh, for your career. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, well, uh, the forest departments are really important because they're the custodians of, the, of many of the areas that we're interested in, in visiting. And uh, so cooperation with them and, and working together with them is, is really important. And of course, each state has a forest department. So it's, you know, there's uh, complicated sort of, you know, relationships that you, you develop. Um, but I also, and so those, those are very important. And, and, you know, I always wanted the work that I did to not just be, you know, a nice landscape, uh, but to contribute to a, a greater sort of movement towards conservation and, and protecting the landscapes. That was, that was a sort of crucial element that I was looking at. Um, I also had a chance to work with several organizations early on uh, when I was out of college. And I worked at first with the Palni Hills Conservation Council, and that's a, a small but really important uh, conservation organization in, um, in based in, in Kodi Canal. Um, and through that organization, I actually went out and met many of the other regional sort of uh, players. I was over in Munar and at the high range with the High Range Wildlife Association, then in the Nilgiris with their Wildlife Association. Um, this is this is like 30 years ago, so it's, it's quite some time. Ago. But I was, you know, I, I also joined the Bombay Natural History Society and I, I'm, I've been involved in, you know, 
small, or, you know, different organizations up and down the, the length and breadth of the, the Western Ghats, I became interested in, in sort of the idea of sort of expanding from the Palni Hills to the whole Western Ghats and sort of trying to document landscapes and, and, and aspects of the ecology that at the time that I started, it wasn't really seen as a sort of a, a cohesive unit. It was sort of a, a blip on, on people's maps. They knew it from that point of view, but the the sense of the place as a, as a, an entire zone was not really well developed. And that was that was happening. I mean, it became a wildlife uh, biodiversity hotspot uh, along the way. And so some really interesting things have happened in the, in the last 30 years that I've been sort of roaming around, you know, taking pictures and, and, and documenting. That's fascinating. Corey, exhibiting in the NCPA in Mumbai must be really special. Tell us about your thoughts, your feelings towards the National Center of the Performing Arts and the Pira Malad Gallery, basically the NCPA premises here in Mumbai City. Yeah, so uh, holding that this um, exhibition at the NCPA is uh, incredibly special for us. Uh, we're incredibly thankful for this opportunity. I think it allows us to spread, uh, you know, our story with a di diverse audience. Certainly the uh, NCPA members, uh, citizens of Mumbai, our school alumni, of which we have many, many in Mumbai. Most importantly, I think we get to spread this message with young people, um, with students. So, um, you know, I think that that really being at the NCPA um, allows us to spread our, our mission about environmental conservation. Um, and really, I think at the core of it is that everyone can be a steward of the environment, you know, whether you're sitting here in the Polony Hills or in Mumbai. So, so yes, we're incredibly grateful to the NCPA and we're looking forward to this event. Ian, uh why do you use black and white imagery to capture themes of landscape and ecology in the Western Ghats and of course uh, Sri Lanka too? I believe you've expanded your work from just the Palani Hills through the Western Ghats uh, down into Sri Lanka. Yeah, so black and white is a, a conscious choice, I think, as a medium for me. Uh, it's a choice in mediums. It was, it was born originally out of the necessity of trying to do as much of the process myself and not depending on others. So when I first started out, I mean, I, I mentioned the dark rooms and I, I was using, you know, traditional wet dark rooms, both at home and then at the school that I was, I was teaching at. And that gave me the chance to take the picture from the point of view of exposure and the, you know, the composition and all of that to the development and the, you know, the final print making of it. And so that was that was really important to me to sort of be involved in as much of the process as, as possible, not to sort of be farming that out. But, um, you know, of course, you know, 20 years ago, things changed dramatically with sort of the, the rise of, of, of really high quality digital tools that we have. Right. And um, so I've had to transition, you know, with that naturally and adjust to that. And it's, it's pretty exciting in the sense that um, you know, we can now use, uh, you know, modern techniques, digital techniques, and I can still use some of my negatives, you know, black and white negatives that I had exposed, say, 25 years ago. Some of those are in the show. And because they were very large, they're medium format negatives, they blow up really nicely. And like, I haven't seen them ever before printed like this. And so we hope the audiences, you know, that would be a treat for the audiences to, to see some of those those landscapes blown up that way. Um, but I think aesthetically also it, it's important because there's an emotional language that, that black and white uh, you know, sort of communicates. And, um, you know, you're, it, it, I think, hints at something deeper in, in, the, in the landscape and in, in the place that goes beyond what, you know, a, a color image would give of that. And, and that's part of the sort of the subtle sort of underlying message of the Sky Islands is this is a very special, unique environment and it's in danger, right? And that it's, it's, it's under pressure from, from all of us and we need to do as much as we can to protect it. And that, that feeds into the sort of the mission of the Center for Environment and Humanity at Cody Connell International School. And that's why we're, you know, we're collaborating on this. And it's, it's really a nice sort of, I think, uh, uh, linkage between sort of that message of the Sky Islands and then what CEH is doing. 
Corey, uh, I was doing some essential reading just before this interview was about to start. And uh, I came across a wonderful paragraph that you'd written and somebody shared it with me. He talks about a concept called servant leadership. And I, I have to say, I was mighty impressed. Uh, I'd like you, you to talk about that. You are holding a concept called servant leadership. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, servant leadership is just a general concept in, in leadership that suggests that, um, you know, the, the prime role of a leader is uh, to serve, to serve everyone in the organization. So in a school, that means that uh, the administration certainly serves our students. We serve the parents of our students um, and, and, you know, we serve our staff. Uh, I think that, you know, each and every employee, um, it means approaching your, your, your role with a great deal of humility. Um, it's about choosing ethics over, say, power or uh, profit. Um, and, and it's really, I think, about empowering people in the organization and ultimately setting, uh, you know, setting, a, setting an in, being inspiration, being inspirational to everyone in your organization rather than, um, you know, you know, driven by a mandate. And I, and I think that when I, you know, in the context of our Center for Environment, I think that ultimately, what is it? It's a service. It's a service to to uh, our town. It's a service to the Pawnee Hills. It's a it's intended to be a service to humanity. Um, so I think that extends into the our Center for Environment, uh, and certainly our work that we you know are planning to do here in Mumbai in terms of just reaching a new population. That's wonderful. Now you did say, Ian, you yourself grew up in the Pawnee Hills. Um, and you also mentioned that Sky Islands, uh, uh, for the exhibition, you've used both digital cameras as well as traditional cameras for it, some of your old negatives. I want to understand, when did you realize, at what point did you realize that this is a threatened landscape? Was it something that came to you in the latter half of your career or very early on as a student? I don't know. Yeah, good question. Thanks. Uh, no, definitely we were, I think as students, we were around adults who, uh, you know, helped us to understand that special place, right? The Palmi Hills and, and the Western Ghats in general. And I, I don't think we, we all quite realized it at the time, but they had, you know, a, a really significant sort of uh, role in terms of sowing the seeds of, of, being, of caring for that environment, right? And this is an age when environmentalism hadn't really taken off. It had in, in some places, but like for us, it was still a relatively new concept in the 1980s, right? That idea of, of uh, protecting, you know, the Shola grassland uh, systems up there. So, I mean, as a, as a kid, I we had gone out and again, my, my, my parents played a role in this and they, because they had, what, what had happened is they had seen the landscape in the 1950s when they had been in school. And between the 1950s and the 1980s, when I was in school, there was dramatic change. And that, I mean, where whole mountainsides and, and valleys had gone from being grasslands to being plantations of eucalyptus and fast growing pine trees and, and whatnot. And, you know, a lot of visitors came to Cody and were like, oh, wow, how nice these uh, pine trees are here. Let's go and, you know, and take a dancing picture of us in the pine trees. And that was all very nice, but people had no appreciation for, you know, what had been there and, and how fast that had changed. It had changed in a, in a, in a generation. And I was kind of in a, in a special place in the sense that my, my father, my mother, even my grandfather had been out uh, hiking in those hills and known it to be a very different place. And so that sense that it was changing right there under our noses was uh, something that sort of um, really, I think, got me thinking about our role in, in environmental education, our role in, in what's happening and what we can do to, to not be sort of these agents of destruction. And as Corey said, you know, agents of change, like positive change, right, is what we, what we want to do. Um, the, the Sky Islands concept is, is not my own. I, I, it's, it's actually a concept that was uh, taken from North America, but um, in India, uh, a, a scientist named Robin Vijayan has, has really sort of brought our attention to it and helped us understand it. He studies bird populations, and it's through those studies of, of birds and their genetic sort of links across vast sort of landscapes that we really understand the Sky Island concept now. 
And so this exhibition is sort of building on that and sharing that concept, which, you know, some people know about, but sharing it with a broader audience. And, and Bombay, Mumbai is, is, is a good place uh, to do that, right? Because you're, the Sky Islands are just up the road from you, up in Mahabaleshwar, or down in, you know, the southern Western Ghats, that area. Um, so people can relate to it. People have been up there, but they may not have appreciated just how special those places are and how sensitive and fragile they are. Okay, a special treat uh, for all of you listening, watching. Uh, there are student workshops. There is still place in a Saturday, December 2nd student workshop. Uh, so please get on to book my show and reserve your place. Places are going out very, very fast. There's also a lecture uh, that shall be given on Saturday, the 25th of November at 11 a.m. at the NCPA, the National Center of Performing Arts. And uh, one day before that, Friday, November 24th, 6.30 p.m. at the BNHS, which is the Bombay Natural History Society. Uh, either of you can take this. What can we expect in the workshop? Yeah, so, so again, do you want me to, to take it? Yeah, you do the workshop, I'll do the lecture. That sounds that sounds wonderful. Okay, so um, let me let me just check my notes here because the workshop has a lot to it. So it is um, the, the the one that's that's just been mentioned. So this is open to students ages ten to fifteen. Um, it's on Saturday on Saturday, December second, um, and there's two. There's one at ten a.m., one at two p.m. Um, it's in the gallery. So the the workshop will really um, you know take students on a on an ecological journey, as it were, uh, giving them a glimpse of the Western Ghats and the Pawnee Hills of Cody by by telling the story of of key species, uh, kind of indicator species, and the role that they play in the ecosystem there. Um, you know that the the Nilgiri tar that's grazing is critically important to maintaining the grasslands and the habitat. Uh, and then the students will be brought back to Mumbai to highlight kind of important species found in the Maharashtra Ghats. Um, you know, the Malabar giant squirrel, which by the way is also found here, uh, the Indian golden oriole. Uh, and, and these are both important species for seed dispersal um, and regenerating forests. Um, and it's also, there's also art integrated into this. So students will be able to uh, create their own piece of, of quill art um, which they'll be able to take home um, to celebrate the species that's been highlighted. Sounds wonderful. The lecture, Ian, what can we expect? Yes, yeah, so the lecture is just a chance for me to expand a little bit more on the, on the concept of the Sky Islands, but also to look maybe in a little bit more detail at some of the, the change that's happened and some of the studies that I've been involved in, where we're looking at satellite imagery and looking at, at sort of uh, how landscapes have changed uh, over the last, you know, four decades and uh, using maps and satellite images. So, um, yeah, it should be really interesting. So I want to encourage people to come along and see it. Well, now now that we know Ian's association with the school, he's also a ex-KIS, uh, that's his alma mater. And um, Corey has also talked about collaborating with Ian to bring this exhibition <laughs> to Mumbai, just giving you listings again, Sky Islands, an endangered Indian landscape will be held at the, at the Dilip Ramal Art Gallery from the 23rd of November to the 3rd of December at the NCPA. It's absolutely free. Please come and learn more about uh, this ecosystem. And of course, uh, go to bookmyshow.com to reserve place on the workshop, the lecture, as well as to find out more and ncpamumbai.com. I think a nice way to sign off, Corey, would be you talking about uh, the Kodekanal International School. 1901 wow yeah <laughs> that's quite that, that's quite some heritage and, and history there absolutely i think it's really interesting that where i'm sitting right now is it used to be a hotel in 1890 um and it was essentially you know bought out by uh, an american missionary lady named margaret eddy and uh became a school 120 122 years ago right um and so I think it, it very interesting fact, um, we can check if this is true or not, but I think it's the only hill station in India, maybe in Asia, that was that was settled by Americans uh, and, and wow. not, not British. So it's a very interesting place. Um, 
and we were, you know, rolling along as kind of this this school for American missionary children for decades. Uh, in the mid '70s, I think we had some very visionary leaders um, who who decided that the school should be, you know, uh, opened up, should be inclusive, should be uh, open to different cultures, and and we became the first international baccalaureate school in India, the third uh, IB school in all of Asia uh, in the mid '70s. Um, and I think so. I mean, we have that that trailblazing spirit. Certainly, our Center for Environment and Humanity is part of that. Uh, we see this as just being an incredible thing, uh, you know, for a high school to do, really. Uh, but it fits in perfectly with our mission and vision. Um, something else about the school that's pretty evident just from talking to to Ian is is that um, it brings people back, right? It, it uh, Ian's parents went there. Uh, let Ian, Ian uh, went there and his his brother and and cousins, um, and I, I think that I, I think this is evident in Ian's photography, uh, just how much um, you know Ian and other alumni just love this place. Uh, so it is the kind of school that that brings people back, that elicits a lot of emotion, a lot of love, uh, a lot of dedication, and I think uh, definitely the sense of wanting to serve. Um, this town and this region. Um, and now we get to do it, you know, through the environment, which is so incredibly important. That's excellent. Uh, Corey, Ian, I really appreciate your time. Thank you uh, for speaking to us and do enjoy your time at the NCPA when you're here in Mumbai City. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. 94.3 Radio 1.